so this record uh, was recorded between February and August of 1969, and it was released on September 26th of 1969. So... Depending on how you want to look at this, this is either the Beatles' final album or their penultimate album. It was uh, the, the the final album that they recorded because it was recorded after they recorded Let It Be, but it was released um, before Let It Be. So there was just kind of different why, why is things that, that were happening why with the that productions. Happen? Yeah, um, I'll get a little bit more into that when, when we do Let It Be because we are going to cover that record in the 70s. But Let It Be was kind of its own project that wasn't just an album. It was also supposed to be a movie and, you know, coupled with a concert. It was just this huge concept and it mm -hmm. kind of just didn't go very well. And there was questions over who was going to be producing it and how it would come out. Um, and it just there was a whole bunch of nonsense going on behind it. So uh, but this album was a little bit more straightforward. Um, can I also so, make a recommendation here? Yeah. CTS Hall of Fame, Matt's use of penultimate. I'd like to throw <laughs> It's a good word, isn't it? <laughs> I'd like to nominate that for our CTS Hall of Fame right now. Sure. I feel like we need to have some sort of some sort of uh, sound effect for when you use it. It's a great word. But I'm trying to get it. you guys to do it too, but it's not, it's not taken. We haven't taken know. to it yet, and I think no. it's going to be a catchphrase for Matt, and I'm going to think about how we're going to deal with that in the 1970s. John, I think you should add that to my CTS t-shirt. <laughs> yes, I agree. But we need to start having some catchphrases because, you know, we need to be more marketable. And I think penultimate is going to be the first of Matt's pen, uh, catchphrases. I'll, 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 I'll wear that with a bad, that badge of honor, man. Um, but continue. I will continue. Carol King on the, the Hall of Fame. Yeah, game. yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I look at this as being their final studio album, and um, that would be make it number 12, their, their 12th studio album. It was uh, immediately successful upon its release, but it did have a lot of mixed reviews. Some of its detractors found it to be, uh, you know, inauthentic, and they didn't really, you know, like the production. Felt it was overdone with artificial effects. Um, but in, over the years, you know, many critics have come around um, to to hail this as their finest album, or one of their finest albums at least it's their second biggest selling album of all time behind sergeant pepper it sold over 30 million copies uh and incorporates genres such as the blues rock and pop and did you guys catch the prominent uh one of the prominent musical instruments used in this record oh god there were like a jillion prominent well there's one that's also a, that's part of the cts uh you know hall of fame that we uh Mellotron? We discussed before close moog synthesizer, moog synthesizer. Oh, yes. yeah, i did i did uh, catch that though yeah i did it's used it's used i believe in four different songs george harrison wow. got himself a a moog synthesizer it was one of the first british artists to, to have one and um they they made good he use didn't borrow of it. mickey dolan's moog synthesizer it didn't say that it said that he was rocking that in, like 1967 yeah well mickey dolan's was uh, was american though wasn't he he was yep yeah so uh it took a little i think it took a little longer to get across the sea but uh so yes you got the Mo moog synthesizer on this it's their only album that was recorded exclusively through something called a solid state transistor mixing desk so this which which can you attribute for a more clearer and brighter sound than they were getting in their previous records um and it was also recorded on an eight track and it was the first album that they released that was not um, released in mono. There's so, a lot of, once again, Frank Zappa uh, inspiration there. Wasn't he like a big inspiration on them? Yes. Yeah. Because it's, that it, yeah. eight track uh, and 16 tracking was the Frank Zappa special, if you remember yeah, he around would, this time. Yeah. Hot Rats, right? That was like yep. the, mm -hmm. the big record for that. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so this album was really, they finished the recording sessions for what, what would end up being Let It Be. And within a couple of weeks, within three weeks, they started recording uh, for Abbey Road. Um, the band was having some disagreements about who was going to manage them. Because you remember Brian Epstein, their manager, had passed away in 1967. Uh, they, the, everybody in the band except McCartney wanted Alan Klein, who we might have mentioned him before, but he, he, came, uh, he was uh, representing the Rolling Stones. And uh, but Paul McCartney wanted uh, his soon to be father in law, Lee Eastman, to manage them. But uh, he was outvoted, which <laughs> I don't. I, and it turns out that Alan Klein wasn't the best dancer either, because there was a lot of uh, legal, uh, you know, actions that were taken later on because he did kind of um, swindle them out of a bunch of money. Uh, but McCartney did approach George Martin for one more recording after uh, Let It Be. And Martin agreed that he would only do this if they did it the way that they used to, um, which, you know, try to you know be free of the tension, do something with a little bit more, you know, ease. Um, 
you know, when we talked about the White Album, certainly with Let It Be, there was a lot of tension in the band. Um, and they were able to be fairly successful with that. The band generally got along, though there was some uh, disagreements that they had. One of the main, uh, Yoko was still very prominent with this record. And she, even to the point where she and John Lennon, I didn't know this beforehand, she and John Lennon got into a car accident in June of, of 69. So about midway through the recording of the record. And she was um, advised by the doctor to remain in bed. So John Lennon brought in a a bed into the That's recording the bed studio, in, right? That's the bed oh in. Oh my god! Well, I, no, the bed in was well, the bed in was like a That's protesting the peace, thing. That's the peace the, love bed in, right? Right. This was just yeah. I'm going to bring a bed into the recording studio so Yoko can be there while we record this record. Oh, well. So yeah, so he couldn't couldn't so, do without her, man. So Matt, I don't. You might get to this, but behind the scenes, had they already decided that they were going to? part ways and like end things and this was going to be like their final album or i think that the uh the i think that some of the writing was on the wall but it wasn't official they actually had a meeting after this record um where they made a, a, a an agreement that they were saying well if we do another album what we should do is really let's stop using lennon mccartney songs let's do four john will get four songs credited to him paul will get four credited to him george will get four credited to him and ringo will get two so there, there was um, that kind of agreement was talked about and somewhat agreed upon, but um, but they did end up breaking up after that. So there was but then they all instead decided to release double albums instead, <laughs> like when they were or done. triple albums, triple as, albums in yeah. the case of Harrison, yeah, yeah. So the public didn't know this was the last no. Beatle no, album. No, 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 okay. no. Um, it, it's kind of like what Kiss did <laughs> when they each oh, released yeah. an album. Do tell their different oh. names. Oh, oh yes, that, oh. you don't remember that? So Kiss decided in the late 70s to each release their own solo album under their own name and mm -hmm. see basically who sold. So the original four members of Kiss each released their own solo album. Oh, who uh, won out on that, that one? Yeah. Yeah. Most people considered the Ace Freely album to be the strongest mm. of the four albums. Uh, and most people consider the Peter Chris one to be the weakest. <laughs> and then it depends. The, often to, I, I would say that the Gene Simmons one is the second best one. But anyway, that's please, for another time. <laughs> please yep. tell me we're covering one of those, John. Is that Not is that the solo one? albums, no. no. no? I, could, okay. I could try to build one into a book bonus episode for you though so <laughs> you'd have to listen to all four though to be able to compare and contrast <laughs> the spin-off kiss cast that we're yeah. going to do uh, but oh, to continue so anyway, Matt, back, I don't to, back to abbey road uh so there so one of the um things that they were discussing was how the format the record lennon wanted all of his songs to be on one side of the album and mccartney's on another side um and mccartney and and george martin were both favoring the medley uh like some sort of medley which you hear on the second side of this record mm -hmm. um they kind of wanted to use that as like an artistic um you know approach to the record lennon didn't really want it but he did relent um and that's what you end up having you have kind of you know uh standalone songs mostly on the first side Second side's got a couple standalone songs like Here Comes the Sun, but which opens the second side. But the majority of the second side is a, a medley of about eight songs, I think, within a couple of minutes that they just, you know, mm -hmm. bleed right into each other. Um, so uh, that was the stat. That was the, uh, the structure of it. The beginning of the recording, like I said, took place in... Uh, three weeks after the recording of uh, Let It Be. But then they had to go on pause. Josh, have you ever heard of a film called The Magic Christian? No, I have not. Well, this Sounds is a film fascinating. that Ringo Ringo was um, had had a, had an acting gig for a, for a film called The Magic Christian, which he starred in uh, alongside Peter Sellers, John Cleese, Christopher Lee, Richard Attenborough, Raquel Welch, and Roman Polanski. Wow. And I've heard about that, Matt. I've heard that they have told you? him that all he has to do is act naturally. Oh God! Oh <laughs> God! <Continue>. God! <laughs> Oh my goodness! Uh, can we add that out? Uh, so Ringo, so Ringo had to go away for uh, several, I think, a couple months. He was recording this film, so they they kind of went on break, but then they came back. So most of this record actually was recorded in July and August of 1969. Um, Lennon there's ultimate. Some, there's something go, funny about the rest of the band waiting for Ringo to come back, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, he yeah yeah. I well, I was just gonna say he played drums, but McCartney could have. I mean, I. 
McCartney certainly would have been in a position to be like, yeah, screw it. Let's just play. Let's just, let's just do it. But who would stop them from fighting with each other if Ringo wasn't? Exactly. There There you go. He was the peacemaker. So um, Lennon ultimately did not like this record. Uh, He particularly disliked the medley on side two. He called, he called McCartney's songs, quote, music for the grannies to dig. Uh, John Lennon used that. I, I found that quote a lot. He described a lot of McCartney's stuff as granny music. Yeah. Um, he was kind of know. a piece of work during this time. Well, they both were, but oh, he God. really was becoming yeah. a piece of work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was doing, yeah, around this time, he actually did the bed in, John, that you were talking about. Give Peace a Chance was recorded by Plastic Ono Band. So, you know, that was kind of going on as well. But yeah, he... He was kind. Of, he wasn't the nicest guy um, at this time, to say I the mean, least. I mean, they really just like, you know, personality-wise and artistically, I think they were in far different places than yes. when they started. The oh, perhaps, yeah. oh, perhaps, perhaps yeah. most importantly, Matt, when was the time where they both posed completely naked on the front of that cover? Was that oh, that was during 1970? the uh, that, No, no, no. That was we already talked about that. That was right. um, that was during the recording of the White Album, actually. So okay, that was, was like okay, in so 60, it was earlier. Yeah. 68, I think 68, mm-hmm. maybe two virgins mm-hmm. came out. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, Talk they about here comes the sun. <laughs> <laughs> what? John, these jokes. Oh or or a di- or a different white album. What are you been working on your material? Come on. Nope, I'm I'm just live tonight. So he's like bad com- the- He's like bad comedian Eli Manning <laughs> from the. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what my role is on the podcast. Bad comedian. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, so Lennon didn't like it. Uh, George Martin called this his favorite Beatle album, though, and um, it's over. Time has has favored this uh, album uh, well. It's it certainly made the top of our list. It's number five in the Rolling Stone top five hundred albums, the most recent um, countdown that they did, um, which was the highest charting Beatles album. So, uh, yeah, this album has definitely risen in the um, the, the the ranks, so to speak. But um, what did you guys think? Let's start with. Uh, um let's go with i don't know john we'll start with you abbey road what do you think (laughs) oh like i i said earlier that i've long said either help or white album is up in the top of my favorite albums and abbey road was that this is after listening to all the beatles album this this is the best beatles album by i think a light years to be wow Wow. wait better than help yeah Wow. And better than the White Album, the, you, which are the two albums that I would say. And you yeah. weren't expecting that. Well, you know, uh, I kind of was expecting it because Abbey Road over time has, I won't say it's grown on me because I liked it immediately upon hearing it. But my my argument with Abbey Road always was that I didn't necessarily love the back half of the album. Like mm-hmm. I did, I didn't think it was as consistent as other Beatles albums, but I've kind of come to realize that there's still enough brilliance in that back end of it to balance out, to not negatively balance at just the brilliance of the first, I would say nine songs, but especially seven songs. I mean, it's just the first seven songs of this album are nearly flawless. They're all very different. There's they different are, people yeah. singing. There's different people. There's different compositions. Uh, my two favorite Beatles songs are back to back on this album. In "I Want You, She's So Heavy" and "Here Comes the Sun," they're totally different. One is seven minutes and forty-seven seconds and is super avant-garde. The other is just a like pretty much a perfect pop nugget. Um, but that's what makes the Beatles so incredible. It's that you can put those two songs next to each other. And then before it, you've got Octopus's Garden, which makes me smile every single time I hear it. Oh, Darling, which is like a throwback to like the early Beatles in many ways, like an homage to what they Mm -hmm. used to be. A a kind of hilarious American Psycho-esque lyrical like journey in Maxwell's Silver Hammer at number three. Something which a lot of people think is their favorite Beatles song. I like, but... I think I wouldn't go so far as to say what John Lennon says, but it is a little schmaltzy. It's like a dance at a wedding song, I would say, and come together, which is way ahead of its time. So, yeah, I mean, you can't do much better than the first seven or maybe even nine tracks. Depending I like on how you went in reverse on that, John. Yeah, but <laughs> it's just, yeah, I just, I started at seven and I wanted to work my way up. It's very, so. very Beatles of you. Yeah, it's hey, you have to change the format every once in a while when you've done this many Beatles albums, right? So, <laughs> yeah, but sure. no, this is this is the production on this album is fantastic. The variance of songs, I I would definitely say this is the Beatles at their peak. It really is, and it's that's why it's fascinating that they pretty much left on this coda, you know, because yeah, it was the last stuff they recorded because Let It Be was recorded before this. Um, yeah, it's it's a remarkable album. It's one of my favorite albums of the entire decade. Um, I can continue to expand on it. Wow. 
Especially, wow. I Want You, She's So Heavy is is a phenomenal song. Like, I can't stress enough it the way it deconstructs itself. Matt, I know you love Radiohead, but you want to talk about a prototype for, like, what Radiohead did later. There you go. Mm. In terms of In terms mm. of the deconstruction of the narrative. Maybe not the sound, but the layering. It, it, just fantastic. Wow. I, yeah. oh, I'm surprised. I didn't see that coming. All right. Yeah. Josh. Uh, you, uh... I am mixed to negative on this album, and oh, I think this album oh boy. is wow. a little overrated, frankly. Um, I think it's... I'm just fighting words. All yeah, right, let's hear I, it. I think the there are pieces that are good, but the whole does not cohere together for me, and I and that's why I don't think it's one of their... It's it's definitely not one of my favorite Beatles albums, and and I the back half of the album did not uh did not cohere for me in the way that the front half of the album did um i i found it a little not distracting but it really i really couldn't get into the vibe of it it kind of threw me off the way the songs blended together when especially when uh the first front half didn't do that at all um i feel like there are some pretty weak songs on here despite there being some some strong songs where and in my head when i'm thinking about the other beatles albums i like better i feel like that if like matt said if we're thinking about the albums as a whole mm. uh, there's just stronger songs and more consistency on other beatles albums that i that i like more even if you stop this at track number nine well they didn't stop at track number nine <laughs> they okay did. okay then i got that you. that would be a different story um, i'm just wondering yeah yeah i mean um what else was i gonna say it feels it feels a little i don't know slapdash sounds a little hard but it didn't seem like their hearts in it f for me um almost like they're just they don't have a consistent theme or idea of what they want to do or what they are trying to accomplish and, and they are more just kind of almost putting together uh remnants or just putting together what they had already even though i don't think that's the case um that's kind of what it seemed like to me um i do like a lot of the songs on here um come together octopus's garden um you never give me your money which i think is a pretty good song and i like golden slumbers a lot too i think that's a, a pretty a beautiful song but for some, I'm pretty mixed on like Maxwell Silver Hammer. I listening to the lyrics, it's it's just kind of a nonsense song, even though the the melody is is pretty catchy. Um, I kept trying to, I kept thinking like, is this a true story about like a serial killer or something? <laughs> like, where did they get this from? And um, I I hard disagree on. It. I want you. She's so heavy. I think it's a repetitive long song that. <sighs> other artists earlier artists blues artists do better and it just they, blues I, don't, artists, interesting. I don't see, i don't see the deconstruction it almost sounded it reminded me of a pink floyd song in a way too um just the way that they're trying to go hard on that i don't know what it is the that sound on it um what else do i have yeah, so that's kind of where I am. I'm. I welcome the uh, the discussion on this, but I'll be fascinating to hear what Matt has to say. Yeah, maybe he's somewhere in the middle. Who knows? I haven't disagreed more with Josh ever in this podcast. <laughs> I, I agree. You're, I'm just shocked. <laughs> you're freaking Looney Tunes, man. This album is is this is my favorite. This is the best Beatles album for me, and it didn't take this podcast for me to realize that. I've known that for years, and mm. every time I listen to this record, I am I I finish listening to it and I go, yep, still my favorite record. I've since it's been years. It's been like fifteen. 15 years, maybe 20 years that I've, that I felt this way about this record. I love everything about it. Um, I think that every song is super strong. I, I get why the medley is, uh, is off putting for people. Josh, you're not wrong in that they, a lot of these songs were actually started, but never really completed or, um, or they were started in, in, in India when they were like mm. stuff that some of the stuff on this record was supposed to be in, originally intended for the white album yeah. and just didn't make it on there. Um, so 
so you're not wrong in that, but I I disagree. I think it's it's to me it's a very cohesive record. I love the fact that everybody is on here. George finally gets his due with yep. two of his greatest songs. He finally you know, rises to the level of Lennon and McCartney. Something I agree with you, John. I think that Here Comes the Sun, it, I, I think it probably is my favorite Harrison song, although Close Second is uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Mm -hmm. I, I do like so, I do like Something a lot, and that's the song that, I mean, that's the one that um, was the only number one single, that the only A-side, actually, that George ever had was Something. It's their so, second. So it's, those are his two songs, Here yes, Comes the Sun and Something. And Something. Okay. Something was, um, it, it, and it's the second most covered Beatles song of all time behind mm -hmm. Yesterday. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's this ubiquitous song that everybody loves. I mean, I posted that on the Twitter feed that Frank Sinatra said that it was his favorite Lennon McCartney song, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and McCartney. I don't know was, if I'd use that as an, as a, uh, endorsement <laughs> there. Yeah. Well, that was just funny. But Len, Len, McCartney's like, thanks, Frank. That's wow, that's <laughs> yeah. nice of you. All right, I'll take it. But um, McCartney said this was his favorite um, song. So I love, you've got George right up there. Ringo's got a fantastic song on this album. I love, I've, Octopus's Guard is just a fun song. Um, There's a great YouTube clip of him starting to write it and george harrison's basically giving him feedback yes. as it's going along yeah it's it's a really cool I, did, I haven't seen that clip john but you're right george did have a little hand in some of the um the songwriting with that record that with that uh, recording um you know ringo actually came up with the idea he was on a on a boat with uh peter sellers again he was hanging out with peter sellers or whatever <laughs> in sardinia and the cap the, the captain of the ship was explaining to him how octopuses you know, or octopi really <laughs> uh, gather <laughs> gather a bunch of stones, you know, to create their own gardens and shiny rocks and stuff. And Ringo loved that idea, and he also loved the uh, the idea of getting away because he was kind of sick of dealing with the, the bitterness and the bickering of all the rest of the Beatles. <laughs> I can so imagine. Like, I just want to go away and hang out with an octopus. Um, so I love that Ringo's on this. This is a happy album. I've always felt that this is a happy record in, in general, and I love that this is the note that the Beatles go out on, especially because when we get to Let It Be, we're going to talk about. Out, you know how that was not a happy recording you know recording situation and mm -hmm. how they were really at each other's throats as a huge Beatles fan I love that they end like this all of them contributing Lennon you I want you she's so heavy is is I, I don't know what you I, I guess if you if you don't like the repetitive nature of it okay but what they do in that repetition the way it builds and it just gets louder and this menacing sound in 1969 this is like yep, groundbreaking stuff uh -huh. um and and i the first actually the, the first time i heard that song i was like wait a minute the beatles sound like they're ripping off motley crew because if either of you ever listened to the album dr feel good the end of the song called slice of your pie is a knockoff of the end of I Want You, She's So Heavy. And I was a big Motley Crue fan back in the day. So when I heard this, I was like, whoa. And I didn't realize that this was the Beatles. And I was kind of blown away by that fact. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. It's not well, totally like it. So I can't imagine that they got sued for it. But it's definitely, it's a definite knockoff. Can, it's not can, I, ex good. can I expand on that too? Like, Yeah, go ahead. Th first of all, Paul McCartney's playing like metal bass in that yeah. song. I'd like yeah, to point yeah. out, which is the thing that always amazes me on that. Like he's... Of all people, like Paul McCartney playing metal bass is ridiculous. Also, the lyrics that are there, it's like that song is so clearly musically about about uh, Yoko. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. it sounds like what Yoko was like to be around. I'm sh I, I don't even need to like read to know that that's what that song's about. You know, mm -hmm. like it's so if you do that and then. Remember in jazz, we talked about those arpeggios, the idea of arpeggios. Yep. That song's just filled with arpeggios. Yes. It's yep. fascinating. So it's like all three of those things together make that song. Uh, to me, it's probably the most interesting Beatles song hmm. for that wow. reason. And then to follow not, it with the sweet, he... sweetness of Here Comes the Sun is yeah, what did, makes that cool, too. I did not notice any of that <laughs> listening to it. <laughs> Well, and that's and the cool thing was is they were that song was supposed to go longer, and then the recording studio John just goes tells the engineer cut it right there at like the seventh. Well, and his voice breaks at one point, doesn't it? Like when he screams, and that's is that the song? Yeah, that's the song where he screams that like yeah, right, and his voice cracks. Oh, yeah. in yeah, the middle was, of it, yes. which mm -hmm. I love too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I and you're right, John. I love because that song ends the album. So if you had the side one, side two, that ends the album. Just mm -hmm. done. And then, and then you turn the album over and it's Here Comes the Sun. And it's such the juxtaposition is just perfect. It's so well done. Um, Maxwell Silverhammer, I really enjoyed. I really enjoy that song. The rest of the band 
hated it. Like like Lennon, Ringo, and Harrison were all hated the recording of that. McCartney made them just like keep playing it over and over again till it was perfect, and they just they thought the song sucked. Um, but I could I, see I, having to play that over and over again; it would get old. But when you listen to it just once or twice, it's very. I love the I love the clever. guitar part. It's happy. Hey, look at look. Paul definitely writes his granny music shit. I like it. I like oh blah dee, oh blah da. I like this. I like that's not you know, granny music though. That's pretty edgy. Well, you know, especially like, for 1969. Well, like the but the but the melody, right? It's just like yeah. this. It's it's right. a little bit of a dopey do 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 do. But know, isn't that kind of what they're going for? Like here's oh, this yeah. morose song, and it's yeah the dopey yes. thing. Yeah, yeah. Paul was doing his avant garde thing, you know. But the yeah. rest of the band, like Lennon in particular, hated when McCartney was kind of using that musical style, if you will. Um, I I always liked it. I, I'll I'm you know I'm more of a John guy musically, but I I always. I never minded Paul doing that stuff, but um, um, and and as far as the medley goes, I love how they bring other stuff back. Like when you're t- when you do um, that golden slumbers and and to carry that weight, and they bring back you never mm-hmm. give me your money, and this it's beautiful, it's great, it's just, and then they finish with the end, and they Ringo gets a drum solo, they're all playing guitars, and I I I, I saw this great quote from one of the engineers that was in the studio at the time. And, and this is, again, goes to the, the happy feeling and the vibe that was in the studio at this time. He says, John, and, John Paul, and George looked like they had, cause, I'm sorry, in, in the, the guitar parts, they each take a turn playing a, a guitar solo. It goes, Paul goes first, and then George, and then John, and then they repeat it three different times. So they're t- doing several bars of guitar solos. And he says, John, Paul, and George looked like they had gone back in time, like they were kids again, playing together for the sheer enjoyment of it. More than anything, they reminded me of gunslingers with their guitars strapped on, looks of steely-eyed resolve, determined to outdo one another. Yet there was no animosity, no tension at all. You could tell that they were simply having fun. And I loved that quote. That was just, that's how I wanted the Beatles out, the Beatles to end. And they, they go out perfectly you know um could they have done more albums sure um i don't think that they could have ended better than this um this i love this record i i will say that i'm not a huge fan of the medley matt so i can't say i agree that it's perfect but Uh you know carry that weight is pretty iconic um as is golden slumbers in terms of thinking about the beatles so there's some good yeah but i i mean i hear all that i guess i don't I guess I didn't appreciate or or hear kind of the it sounds like you really picked up on the technical aspects of the production and how maybe more complex it is compared to some of their other um, work. Is that fair to say? I, I yeah, I mean, I, I think the production is definitely better. I can certainly say that. I, I, I just think it's everything. I don't think that there's any one thing that stands out. I think it's the entire piece that really is doing it for me. Um, and I um, I think that um, it's just so well done. The, the harmonies, right? You talk, We haven't even talked about because yet. You know, that's – I don't think that's quite – is that part of the – I think that is the beginning of the um, – no way, it's not. It's not. I don't think it's part of the medley. It's like right before. But that mm-hmm. that melody, that the harmony, they they like re, they layered that. That's like that's three part harmony recorded three different times, and that's why you have that lush recording. You know that sound. So I guess that's part of it, Josh. I th- that's definitely that's definitely in yeah. there. Um, you know, also because uh, uh, McCartney and Harrison said that that was their favorite song on this record. Mm-hmm. Um, but so John, did you uh, going back to uh, I want you? She's so heavy. Have you ever heard of the uh, musical genre doom metal? Yep, I had because I hadn't heard of that, and some I guess a couple of uh, writers for Guitar World or something, and they were ranking, the, and they said that this was a pre, uh, inadvertent precursor to doom metal. So I don't know if this uh, sounds like know. doom metal to you, but uh, these I, were dudes uh, in a metal magazine, John. So, but that's, yeah, it does I mean, it's, it does sound metal. You got to admit it does sound metal for the sixties, yeah, right? I did it's heavy. give Paul. I did give Paul the the you know he's playing metal mm-hmm. guitar, so I agree with that. But I don't know if I'd agree that it's well. I guess I'd have to. I'd have to isolate the bass <laughs> to see if it sounds like doom metal, but I don't know if any part of the rest of the song sounds I, like I had doom to look metal. up what yeah. doom metal was, and then I looked at all the bands. I was like, I've, I don't know any of these bands. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not a super not aficionado my... of it. I just know the general sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also don't like how the album ends um, with that short snippet of Her Majesty oh. and... And I've, it's just kind of abrupt. I mean, why not so, end? Why not end with the end? So know? the story behind that is: so that song, so Her Majesty was actually supposed to be part of the medley, um, and if you notice the very beginning um, chord of it, 
um, was is the end of Mean Mr. Mustard. It, it would it would fall right in the, you know at the end of Mean Mr. Mm-hmm. Mustard, and the end of it goes right into Polythene Pam. But okay. McCartney didn't like the way that it fit, so he kind of just he asked them to remove it. And it was kind of done by accident because the the instruction for the engineers was don't throw away anything, just kind of like you know leave it around. Well, somebody just tacked it onto the end of the album, and when they by you know just did it, and then mm-hmm. when the band heard it, they liked it and they decided to keep it in. So um so yeah, it's an and, and then the initial release of the record, it wasn't listed as one of the tracks. Um mm-hmm. so it's like in a, one of the you know earliest uh you know hidden tracks if you will. Um but later on it's been put on there. So yeah, it's kind of it does it that seems a little strange, but um. I, it's what is it? It's like twenty seconds. Or it's really short. Seconds, yeah. yeah, it's really short, and uh, you know, it's 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 kind of a weird thing. But um, but yeah, I I, I it's it's a little strange. Hmm. Okay. I, yeah, I guess for me that's just kind of an example of the disjointedness I feel in this album, or the uh, kind of the all over the placeness. But okay, well, it sounds like you guys are definitely higher on it than me. Maybe in a, another uh, five years, I'll I'll feel differently. When we do our best ever, when we do our own best ever album, <laughs> we'll do we'll do an, we'll do our own episode where we rank all the Beatles <laughs> yeah. records. Yeah, exactly. John, any final thoughts from you? I don't think so. Loved it. 